Chapter 2 Wherein Freckles Proves His Metal and Finds Friends Next morning found Freckles in clean, whole clothing, fed, and rested. Then McLean outfitted him and gave him careful instructions in the use of his weapon. The boss showed him around the timber line and engaged for him a place to board with the family of his head teamster, Duncan, whom he had brought from Scotland with him, and who lived in a small clearing he was working out between the swamp and the corduroy. When the gang started for the south camp, Freckles was left to guard a fortune in the Limberlost. That he was under guard himself those first few weeks he never knew. Every hour was torture to the boy. The restricted life of a great city orphanage was the other extreme of the world compared with the Limberlost. He was afraid for his life every minute. The heat was intense. The heavy waiting boots rubbed his feet until they bled. He was sore and stiff from his long tramp and outdoor exposure. The seven miles of trail was agony at every step. He practiced at night under the direction of Duncan until he grew sure in the use of his revolver. He cut a stout hickory cudgel with a knot on the end as big as his fist, and it never left his hand. When he thought, what he thought in those first days he himself could not recall clearly afterward. His heart stood still when he saw the beautiful marsh grass begin a sinuous waving against the play of the wind, as McLean had told him it would. He bolted a half mile with the first boom of the bittern, and his hat lifted with every yelp of the sheet folk. Once he saw a lean, shadowy form following him and fired his revolver. Then he was frightened worse than ever for fear it might have been Duncan's collie. The first afternoon that he found his wires down, and he was compelled to plunge knee-deep into the black swamp muck to restring them, he became so ill from fear and nervousness that he scarcely could control his shaking hand to do the work. With each step, he felt that he would miss secure footing and be swallowed in that clinging sea of blackness. In dumb agony, he plunged forward, clutching the posts and trees until he had finished restringing and testing the wire. He had consumed much time. Night closed in. The Limberlost stirred gently, then shook herself, growled, and awoke around him. There seemed to be a great owl hooting in every hollow tree, and a little one screeching from all the knotholes. The bellowing of monster bullfrogs was not sufficiently deafening to shut out the wailing of whippoorwills that seemed to come from every bush. Nighthawks swept past him with their shivering cry, and bats struck his face. A prowling wildcat missed its catch and screamed with rage. A strained fox bayed incessantly for its mate. The hair on the back of Freckles' neck rose as bristles, and his knees wavered beneath him. He could not see whether the dreaded snakes were on the trail or in the pandemonium, hear the rattle for which McLean had cautioned him to listen. He stood motionless in an agony of fear. His breath whistled between his teeth. The perspiration ran down his face and body in little streams. Something big, black, and heavy came crashing through the swamp close to him, and with a yell of utter panic, Freckles ran. How far, he did not know. But at last he gained control over himself and retraced his steps. His jaws set stiffly and the sweat dried on his body. When he reached the place from which he had started to run, he turned and with measured steps made his way down the line. After a time, he realized that he was only walking, so he faced that sea of horrors again. When he came toward the corduroy, the cudgel fell to test the wire at each step. Sounds that curdled his blood seemed to encompass him in shapes of terror to draw closer and closer. Fear had so gained the mastery that he did not dare look behind him. And just when he felt that he would fall dead before he ever reached the clearing, came Duncan's rolling call, Freckles! Freckles! A shuddering sob burst in the boy's dry throat. But he only told Duncan that finding the wire down had caused the delay. The next morning he started on time. Day after day, with his heart pounding, he ducked, dodged, ran when he could, and fought when he was brought to bay. If he ever had an idea of giving up, no one knew it for he clung to his job without the shadow of wavering. All these things, insofar as he guessed them, Duncan, who had been set to watch the first weeks of Freckles' work, carried to the boss at the South Camp, but the innermost exquisite torture the big Scotsman never guessed, and McLean, with his finer perceptions, came only a little closer. After a few weeks, when Freckles learned that he was still living, that he had a home, and the very first money he ever had possessed was safe in his pockets, 
he began to grow proud. He yet sidestepped, dodged, and hurried to avoid being late again, but he was gradually developing the fearlessness that men ever acquire of dangers to which they are hourly accustomed. His heart seemed to be leaping when his first rattler disputed the trail with him, but he mustered courage to attack it with his club. After his head had been crushed, he mastered an Irishman's inborn repugnance for snakes sufficiently to cut off its rattles to show Duncan. With this victory, his greatest fear of them was gone. Then he began to realize that with the abundance of food in the swamp, flesh hunters would not come on the trail and attack him, while he had his revolver for defense if they did. He soon learned to laugh at the big floppy birds that made horrible noises. One day, watching behind a tree, he saw a crane solemnly performing a few measures of a belated nuptial song and dance with his mate. Realizing that it was intended in tenderness, no matter how it appeared, the lonely, starved heart of the boy sympathized with him. Before the first month passed away, he was fairly easy about his job, and by the next he rather liked it. Nature can be trusted to work her own miracle in the heart of any man who daily tasks keeps him alone among her sights, sounds, and silences. One day after day, the only thing that relieved his utter loneliness was the companionship of the birds and beasts of the swamp. It was the most natural thing in the world that Freckles should turn to them for friendship. He began by instinctively protecting the weak and helpless. He was astonished at the quickness with which they became accustomed to him and the disregard they showed for his movements when they learned that he was not a hunter and that the club he carried was used more frequently for their benefit than his own. He scarcely could believe what he saw. From the effort to protect the birds and animals, it was only a short step to the possessive feeling, while with that sprang the impulse to caress and provide. Through fall, when brooding was finished and the upland birds sought the swamp and swarms to feast on its seeds and berries, Freckles was content with watching them and speculating about them. Outside of half a dozen of the very commonest, they were strangers to him. The likeness of their actions to humanity was an hourly surprise. When black frosts began stripping the limberlost, cutting the ferns, shearing the vines from the trees, mowing the succulent green things of the swale, and setting the leaves swirling down, he watched with dismay the departing troops of his friends. He began to realize that he was going to be left alone. He made special efforts toward friendliness with the hope that he could induce some of them to stay. It was then that he conceived the idea of carrying food to the birds, for he saw that they were leaving for lack of it. But he could not stop them. Day after day, flocks gathered and departed. By the time the first snow whitened his trail around the Limberlost, there were only the little black and white juncos, the sapsuckers, yellow hammers, a few patriarchs among the flaming cardinals, the blue jays, the crows, and the quail. Then Freckles began his wizard work. He cleared a space of swale, and twice a day he spread a bird's banquet. By the middle of December, the strong winds of winter had beaten most of the seed from the grass and bushes. The snow fell, covering the swamp, and food was almost gone and difficult to find. The birds scarcely waited until Freckles' back was turned to feast upon his provisions. In a few weeks, they flew toward the clearing to meet him. During the bitter weather of January, they came halfway to the cabin every morning and fluttered around him as doves all the way to the feeding ground. Before February, they were so accustomed to him and so hunger-driven that they would perch on his head and shoulders and the saucy jays would try to pry into his pockets. Then Freckles added to wheat and crumbs every scrap of refuse food he could find at the cabin. He carried to his pets the parings of apples, turnips, potatoes, stray cabbage leaves, and carrots, and tied to the bushes meat bones having scraps of fat and gristle. One morning, coming to his feeding ground unusually early, he found a gorgeous cardinal and a rabbit side by side, socially nibbling a cabbage leaf, and that instantly gave to him the idea of cracking nuts from the store he had gathered for Duncan's children, for the squirrels, in the effort to add them to his family. Soon they were coming, red, gray, and black, and B became filled with the vast impatience that he did not know their names or habits. So the winter passed. Every week, McLean rode to the Limberlost, never on the same day or at the same hour. Always he found Freckles at his work, faithful and brave, no matter how severe the weather. The boy's earnings constituted his first money, and when the boss explained to him that he could leave them safe at a bank and carry away a scrap of paper that represented the amount, he went straight on every payday and made his deposit, 
keeping out barely what was necessary for his board and clothing. What he wanted to do with the money he did not know, but it gave to him a sense of freedom and power to feel that it was there. And it was his, and he could have it when he chose. In imitation of McLean, he bought a small pocket account book in which he carefully set down each dollar he earned and every penny he spent. As his expenses were small and the boss paid him generously, it was astonishing how his little hoard grew. That winter held the first hours of real happiness of Freckles' life. He was free. He was doing a man's work faithfully. Through every rigor of rain, snow, and blizzard, he was gathering a wonderful strength of body, paying his way and saving money. Every man of the gang and of that locality knew that he was under the protection of McLean, who was a power. And it had, it had the effect of smoothing Freckles' path in many directions. Mrs. Duncan showed him that individual kindness for which his hungry heart was longing. She had a hot drink ready for him when he came, when he came from a freezing day on the trail. She knit him a heavy mitten for his left hand and devised a way to sew and pad the right sleeve that protected the maimed arm in bitter weather. She patched his clothing, frequently torn by the wire, and saved kitchen scraps for his birds, not because she either knew or cared anything about them, but because she herself was close enough to the swamp to be touched by its utter loneliness. When Duncan laughed at her for this, she retorted, My God, Manny, if Freckles had none of the birds and the beasts, he would be always alone. It was never meant for a human being to be solitary. He'd get touched in the head if he had none of them to think for and to talk to. How much answer do you think he gets to his talking glass? laughed Duncan. He gets the answer that keeps the eye bright, the heart happy, and the feet walking faithful the rough path he'd set them in, answered Mrs. Duncan earnestly. Duncan walked away, appearing very thoughtful. The next morning, he gave an ear from the corn he was shelling for his chickens to Freckles, and told them to carry it to his wild chickens in the Limberlost. Freckles laughed delightedly. Me chickens, he said. Why didn't I ever think of that before? Of course they are. They are just little brightly colored cocks and hens. But wild is no good. What would you say to me wild chickens being much tamer than yours here in your yard? Hoot, lad, cried Duncan. Make yours light on your head and eat out of your hand and pockets, challenged Freckles. Go tell your fairy tales to the wee people. They're just brash on believing things, said Duncan. You cannot invent any story too big to stop them from calling for a bigger. I dare you to come see, retorted Freckles. Take ye, said Duncan. If you make just an bird lit on your hand, or eat for your hand, you are free to help yourself to my corn crib and wheat bin the rest of the winter. Freckles sprang in the air and howled with joy. Oh, Duncan, you're too easy, he cried. When will you come? I'll come next Sabbath, said Duncan, and I'll believe the birds of the Limberlost are tame as barnyard fowl when I see it, and no sooner. After that, Freckles always spoke of the birds as his chickens, and the Duncans followed his example. The very next Sabbath, Duncan, with his wife and children, followed Freckles to the swamp. They saw a sight so wonderful, it will keep them talking all the remainder of their lives, and make them unfailing friends of all the birds. Freckles' chickens were awaiting him at the edge of the clearing. They cut the frosty air around his head into curves and circles of crimson, blue, and black. They chased each other from Freckles, and swept so closely to themselves that they brushed him with their outspread wings. At their feeding ground, Freckles set down his old pail of scraps and swept the snow from a small, level space with a broom improvised of twigs. As soon as his back was turned, the birds clustered over the food, snatching scraps to carry to the nearest bushes. Several, several of the boldest, a big crow and a couple of jays, settled on the rim and feasted at leisure while a cardinal, which hesitated to venture, fumed and scolded from a twig overhead. Then Freckles scattered his store. At once the ground resembled the spread mantle of Montezuma, except that this mass of gaily colored feathers was on the backs of living birds. While they feasted, Duncan gripped his wife's arm and stared in astonishment, for from the bushes and dry grass, with gentle cheeping and queer throaty chatter, as if to encourage each other, came flocks of quail. Before anyone saw it arrive, a big gray rabbit sat in the midst of the feast, contentedly gnawing a cabbage leaf. "'Will I be drawed on?' came Mrs. Duncan's tense whisper. "'Shh, shh,' cautioned Duncan. Lastly, Freckles removed his cap. He began filling it with handfuls of wheat from his pockets. 
In a swarm, the grain eaters arose around him as a flock of tame pigeons. They settled on his arms in the cap, and in the stress of hunger, forgetting all caution, a brilliant cock cardinal and an equally gaudy jay fought for a perching place on his head. Well, I'm beat, muttered Duncan, forgetting the silence imposed on his wife. I'll have to give him in. Seeing is believing. A man would have to see that to believe in. We mun let the boss miss that sight, for it's a chance will no likely come twice in a life. Everything is snowed under, and the creatures near starved, but trust in freckles the complete they are, tamer than our chickens. Look hard, Barnes, he whispered. You winna see the like of yon again, while God lets ye live. Notice their color against the ice and snow, and the pretty skipping ways of them, and spunky. Well, I'm beat fair. Freckles emptied his cap, turned his pockets, and scattered his last grain. Then he waved his watching friends goodbye and started down the timber line. A week later, Duncan and Freckles arose from breakfast to face the bitterest morning of the winter. When Freckles, warmly, warmly capped in gloves, stepped to the corner of the kitchen for a scrap pail, he found a big pan of steaming boiled wheat on the top of it. He wheeled the Mrs. Duncan with a shining face. Were you fixing this warm food for me chickens of yours? he asked. It's for yours, Freckles, she said. I was afeard this cold weather that wouldn't have lay good without a warm bite now and then. Duncan laughed as he stepped to the other to the other room for his pipe, but Freckles faced Mrs. Duncan with the trace of every pang of starved mother hunger he ever had written large on his homely, splotched, narrow features. Oh, how I wish you were my mother, he cried. Mrs. Duncan attempted an echo of her husband's laugh. Lord love the lad, she exclaimed. Why, Freckles, are you no bright enough to learn without being taught by a woman that I am your mother? If a great man like yourself didn't ken that, learn it now and ne'er forget it. Once a woman is the wife of any man, she becomes wife to all men for having had the wifely experience she kens. Once a man-child has beaten his way to life under the heart of a woman, she is mother to all men, for the hearts of mothers are everywhere the same. Bless you, laddie. I am your mother. She tucked the coarse scarf she had knit for him closer to his chest and pulled his cap lower over his ears. But Freckles, whipping it off and holding it under his arm, caught her rough, reddened hand and pressed it to his lips in a long kiss. Then he hurried away to hide the happy, embarrassing tears that were coming straight from his swelling heart. Mrs. Duncan, sobbing unrestrainedly, swept into the adjoining room and threw herself into Duncan's arms. Oh, the pure lad, she wailed. Oh, the pure mother-hungry lad. He breaks my heart. Duncan's arms closed convulsively around his wife. With a big brown hand, he lovingly stroked her rough, sorrel hair. Sarah, you're a good woman, he said. You're a mighty good woman. You have a way of speaking out at times. It's like the inspired prophets of the Lord. If that had been put to me now, I'd have felt all I can't how to and been keen enough to say the right thing. But dang it, I'd have stuttered and stammered and got nothing out that would have done anybody a mite of good. But gee, Sarah, did you see his face, woman? You sent him off looking like a white light of holiness had passed door and settled on him. You sent the lad off too happy for mortal words, Sarah, and you made me that proud of ye. I would not trade ye in my share of the limber lost with only king ye could mention. He relaxed his clasp, and setting a heavy hand on each shoulder, he looked straight into her eyes. You're prime, Sarah, just prime, he said. Sarah Duncan stood alone in the middle of her two-roomed log cabin and lifted a bony, claw-like pair of hands, reddened by frequent immersion in hot water, cracked and chafed by exposure to cold, black-lined with constant battle with swamp loam, and calloused with burns, and stared at them wonderingly. Pretty-looking things ye are, she whispered, but ye had just been kissed, and by such a man. Fine as God ever made at his very best. Duncan wouldn't have trade with a king, <laughs> nah. Nor I wouldn't have trade with a queen with a place. And velvet gowns and diamonds big as hazelnuts and a hundred visitors a day into the bargain. You've been that honored, I'm blessed, if I can bear a susie in the dishwater. Still, that kiss won't come off. Nothing can take it from me, for it's mine till I die. Lord, if I'm a proud, kisses on the old claws. Well, I be drawed on.